Hello, my name is Magnus Peterson. This is my tutorial number 23 on TensorFlow, and this is about time series prediction. You should be familiar with TensorFlow and Keras in general. Those are tutorials number 1 and 3C. And you should also understand the basics of recurrent neural networks, which were explained in tutorial number 20. This is a map of the country I come from, called Denmark, and we want to predict the weather of this city here called Odense 24 hours into the future, given weather data for all of these five cities. And if you are familiar with the famous fairy tale author Hans Christian Andersen, he was born in this city, Odense. This is the city of Aarhus, where I studied computer science, and the inventor of C++ also studied at the same university, and Google's V8 JavaScript engine was also developed in this city. This is the city of Bilot, where the toy company Lego is located. And if you remember from the tutorial on style transfer, we used something called a Gram matrix, which was invented by a man named Gram, or Gram, and he lived in this region here as well somewhere. This map shows Denmark's location in Europe. So we have the United Kingdom here, Norway, Sweden, Poland, Germany, France, and so on, and then Denmark here in the middle. This is a rough flowchart of what we want to do. We have a number of input signals. So this is weather data for our five cities. We only show two in this flowchart here because of the space. So for the city of Olbo, we have the temperature, pressure, wind speed, and wind direction. And we have the same for all of the other four cities. We sent all of this data into a recurrent neural network, and we will use a type called a gated recurrent unit, but you could also use an LSTM. We will use an internal state size of 512. This means that for each time step, it outputs a vector with 512 elements. But for each time step, we only want to predict, in this case, three time series. So we need to convert each vector with 512 elements into a vector with only three elements. So we use a dense or fully connected layer for that. And what we get out are time series for the temperature, atmospheric pressure, and wind speed for the city of Odense, 24 hours into the future. So as usual, we have a number of imports, and we will use Keras, so we need to import that as well. And I got the weather data from the National Climatic Data Center in the United States. Their website and database access was free, but it was very confusing and they are gonna change it soon, but I couldn't figure out how their new interface works and how I would get data from that. So you might have a lot of problems if you want other weather data, but I have made the weather data for Denmark available for download on the internet, and you just import this Python module here and call this function, and it downloads it automatically, and it's about 35 megabytes. So this is a list of the cities that we're going to use. And the original data that I got from the internet was not perfectly aligned in the sense that, for example, in the 1980s, they didn't take measurements so frequently. And the measurements might also have been taken at different times of the day, especially for different cities. So we have to resample all the data. And I put that inside this function here, and it takes about 30 seconds to run the first time, but then it saves a cache file with the resampled data. So the next time you call this function, it loads it very quickly. And we can see the top rows of the data here. So out here, we have the date time index. And up here, we have the city names. And for each city, we have the four types of measurements, temperature, pressure, wind speed, and wind direction. And it continues out here for the other cities. There is some missing data in the data set. And if we plot the atmospheric pressure for the city of Espia, we see these long straight lines here and here and here. And that is because the original data from the internet had missing values. And when I did the resampling, we make a linear interpolation to fill in the missing values. So it took a value here and here, and then it draws a straight line between those two values, and the same here and the same over here. These might confuse the neural network. So the easy solution is that we are going to drop this time series for the pressure of the city of Espia. And we have the same problem here with the pressure for the city of Roskilde. But we could actually repair this data. And the way we would do that is we would basically run the same as we're doing in this notebook here. But instead of predicting the weather data 24 hours into the future, we would want to predict the pressure in the city of Roskilde, given all the other weather data. And then we would train it on this data set here from between here up to here. And then we would generate the missing data here and then fill that back into the data set. 
We're not going to do that in this tutorial here, but you could try and do this as an exercise, because when we throw away all of this data, we're actually throwing away something that might help our predictions quite a lot. So it's a bit of a pity that we're doing it. But that's what we're going to do. And if you note the shape of the data frame before we delete these two series, you will see that it is a matrix with about 333,000 rows and 20 columns one for each of these input signals. And then we drop those two signals that have missing data. And then we see that the matrix only has 18 columns. And we can also look at the data frame to see that the correct columns have indeed been removed. So we have it here. We go over to Espia and we see that the pressure has been removed. We go over to Raskilde and again, the pressure has been removed. I also spotted a couple of data errors. For example, this one, if we have the temperature for the city of Odense, you see that it spikes here. So it goes from around 10 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees on two occasions. But the all time highest temperature measured in Denmark for the past 200 years or something like that was only 36 degrees. So these are clearly data errors. Another way to see that is to look at the city of Aarhus. And because the country is so small, we cannot have huge differences in temperature between two cities. And this one doesn't show those spikes. So once again, it's clear that we have a data error here. We are not going to fix that data error. Hopefully our model will just learn to ignore these data errors. Now we will add two columns of data or two signals of data, because imagine that you have a temperature measurement of 10 degrees Celsius. The model wouldn't know whether that was measured during the day or the night or during winter or summer, because it could be an abnormally high or low temperature. So it could actually be measured at any time during the year and during the day. So we're going to help the model a little by adding a signal or a column in our data frame with the time of day. So that is the hour between zero and 23. And then we also give it the day of the year, which is between one and 366. So now the model can learn what time of year it is and what time of day it is and use that to make better predictions. And you can try as an exercise and remove this and see how that affects your predictions. And now we're going to prepare the target data. And in our example, we just want to predict the weather of the target city Odense 24 hours into the future. So we get the name of the city here and the name of the columns or the signals that we want to predict here. So we have the temperature, the wind speed and the pressure. And then we have to say how much we want to shift that data from the original data frame. So our resampled data is sampled once an hour. So 24 hours means 24 time steps. And then we take the original data frame for the target city and for the target signals. And then we shift it by the negative number of time steps. And I made an embarrassing mistake here. So it's been over two years since I worked on time series. And for a number of reasons, I really wanted to finish this tutorial really quickly. And I forgot to put the minus on here. And if you don't put the minus here, you're essentially trying to predict the past instead of the future. What's interesting is that it didn't actually do it perfectly well. And I think that is probably why I didn't discover that I had made this error. The mistake I made was I didn't double check that I had done it correctly. And that was a stupid fucking embarrassing thing to do. But when you're trying to predict the past, the model could essentially learn that it just has to copy data that it has already seen, for example, 24 time steps in the past, but it didn't learn that. And if you had a time shift of, for example, three or seven days instead, then it also couldn't predict that with any great accuracy. So again, I think that's why I didn't discover it. But you have to double check that you're shifting in the right direction. So one way of doing that is that we print the target data from the original data frame first. So we print the first rows of that data frame and we have the number of steps that we want to shift plus, for example, five. And then we get this whole list here, like so and so. And what we want to do is we want to move them all 24 time steps up. So now let's look at the data frame that we have shifted like that. One of the confusing things is that it doesn't change the timestamp out here. So it still has the same timestamp, but it has actually moved the data. And we can check that by seeing up here and the data here, 2.0000, 6.828 and so on, 1005.83 and so on should correspond to the first row down here. And the next one here, 2.0, 8.2, 1005.2, should correspond to the second one here. So what has happened is that this row here has been moved all the way up to the beginning here. And the data that was originally here has just been pushed out. 
And if we go back down and look at the target data frame again, we will see that all of the last 24 rows, I've only shown five here, but the last 24 rows are now not a number because we have shifted it backwards in time and we simply don't have that data. So now we have missing values here. So what we have now are two data frames, one with the original data, those are our input signals, and another data frame with our output signals, and they have the same shape these two data frames, and they also have the same timestamps. So we could merge these two data frames very easily, but what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna take out the raw data, and we do that like so, and we also remove all the missing values from the end of the output signals, and because we want the two matrices or arrays to have the same shape so that they match up, we also remove the last rows for the input signals. So what we get out is a matrix of this shape here for the input signals and a matrix of this shape here for the output signals. So 20 input signals, three output signals, and 333,085 rows for each of these arrays. We're gonna use 90% of this data set as the training set. So this is the number of rows in our training set and the number of rows in our test set. And then we split the data into training and test set here but the range of the data is very wide, so it goes from minus 27 to about 1050, and the neural network cannot work on data in this range, so we have to scale it down to roughly between minus one and one, which is optimal for the neural network. We use a scalar object from scikit-learn called minmax scalar. So first we detect the range of the input signals in the training set, and then we transform them or scale them so that they're all between zero and one, except for a small rounding error. And then we use the same scalar object for the input signals in the test set. So these are also roughly between zero and one. And in this tutorial, we're gonna use the same weather data for the input signals and the output signals. They are just time shifted 24 hours, but you could have output signals that were completely different. For example, if you want to predict the electricity usage from the weather data, then you would have a completely different range of the output signals. So you might need to use a different scalar for the output signals. So we do that here as well. So you can think of the data that we have now as one long time series with 20 input signals so that each time step has 20 input signals and three output signals. We are not gonna train the recurrent neural network using this entire sequence. Instead, we're gonna break it up into small subsequences and create a batch so that we can use that for training the network. And that is done in this generator function here. So we just loop for eternity. We allocate a new array for the batch of input signals and a new array for the batch of output signals. And then we fill this batch by taking a random index into the training set. And then we copy the subsequences of data starting at this index to the batch. And when we have filled the batch, we return it and we will use a sequence length of 1,344. This corresponds to eight weeks of time steps when we have a sample rate of one per hour. And you will have to experiment with the batch size because it depends on the GPU speed and the amount of RAM you have on your GPU, how high you should set this batch size to get near 100% workload on the GPU while still being able to fit the data in the GPU's RAM. For my GPU, this was the right number. Then we create the batch generator so it's ready to use, and we can try it like so, and we get a batch out where we have a batch size of 256 sequences, where each sequence has 1,344 time steps or observations, and we have 20 input signals and three output signals. And we can plot an example, so this is for the first input signal out of 20, and we can do the same for the output signal. The neural network trains quite quickly, so we have to monitor the performance on a validation set so that we can stop the training when the performance gets worse on the validation set. We will just use the test set for this, and this will not be broken up into subsequences, so we will just use the entire time series from the test set and go through that once for the validation set, but Keras expects a batch-like input, so we just have to expand the dimensionality of this two-dimensional array so it's three-dimensional. So it's like a batch with just one sequence of data. And now we can create the recurrent neural network and we will use the sequential model from Keras to do that. So we add the gated recurrent unit as the first layer in the network. And because it is the first layer, we have to give the input shape of the data that it's gonna receive. And this means it's gonna receive a batch with arbitrary long sequences and each sequence has this number of signals in it. 
and we will use a state size of 512 because I did a few tests and this seemed to work all right. Now, because the output of the gated recurrent unit will also be a sequence of vectors with 512 elements, and we actually want a sequence of vectors with only three elements as the output, we also add a fully connected or dense layer that maps the vectors with 512 elements down to only three elements. Because we used a scalar on the dataset, all of the values are between 0 and 1, and we can help the neural network a little by using the sigmoid activation function so that the output of this dense layer is squashed to be between 0 and 1 as well. However, there is a problem with that because now we can only output values in the same range as our training data. So for example, if the training data only has temperatures between minus 20 and 30 degrees, then the scalar object will map minus 20 to 0 and plus 30 to 1. So that if the output of the neural network is also limited to be between 0 and 1 using the sigmoid function, it means that it can only be mapped back to temperature values between minus 20 and 30 as well. There are different ways of getting around this. One would be to have a margin inside the scalar object, but I'm not sure that scikit-learn's scalar object supports this. Another way would be to have a linear activation function on the last dense layer of the neural network, like so. But I found in my experiments that I would have to initialize the weights of this layer with smaller random values and probably even smaller than these, because otherwise you might get not a number during training because the training would just explode or whatever. So you will probably have to experiment with this to get it working. And now we will make a custom loss function because what we want to calculate is the mean squared error. And if we go down and look at some of the predicted output of the neural network, the predicted output is this yellow or orange line here. And the true output signal is the blue line. So we want the neural network to learn to create this output here. So it is as close as possible to the blue line. And we do that by measuring the difference of the neural network's output, the orange line and the blue line at each time step. So we take the difference, then we square it. So we have a positive value. And then we take the average squared error for each time step. And what we show here on the X axis is the number of time steps that have been processed. What we don't show is the input data. So you have to imagine that the neural network has seen only one time step of input data here. And here it has seen 200 time steps of input data. And here it has seen 400 steps of input data and so on. But down here, it hasn't seen very much input data. So the output of the neural network will probably be very noisy. And if we try to force the neural network to output something sensible, it might distort the inner workings of the recurrent unit so that it tries to output something that on average is all right and that might actually distort and harm the later outputs. So what I have done is that I have given it a warm-up period where we will not consider the difference between the predicted and the true output. We will just ignore it basically. So whatever happens in the first 50 time steps, we don't care about. We will only measure the performance after those 50 time steps. So you see that the model has just produced some really wild output in this warm up period because we don't care about it. Okay, so let's go back to how we have implemented this loss function and we have 50 warm up steps and we're just gonna slice the arrays for the predicted and the true output signals. And then we use a function from TensorFlow to calculate the mean squared error for these slices. And then we just calculate the average and return it. So now we compile the Keras model using this custom loss function and the RMS prop optimizer with the initial learning rate like so. And we can print a summary of the model where we see that the output of the last layer is a tensor with an arbitrary batch size, an arbitrary sequence length, and three output signals. And now we have a few callback functions. So we want to write a checkpoint after each epoch of training. So we can reload it again very quickly without having to redo the training again. Because the model trains very quickly, we will use early stopping so that if it has not improved the performance or the loss value on the validation set, and if that hasn't improved for five epochs, then we stop the training. And we will also save a TensorBoard log so we can inspect it using TensorBoard. And I found in my experience that it's useful to lower the learning rate when the optimization has stagnated and we can squeeze a little more performance out of the network by sort of fine tuning it a little. Now the optimizers in Keras have a parameter called the decay rate for the learning rate, but it's not documented at all. And you have to go into the source code to see what it's doing. And these are really cryptic mathematical formulas. So you really don't understand what it's doing. 
Keras is not perfect. And again, I wish that the TensorFlow developers, the, the Google developers would put more resources into really polishing Keras and make it really good. Anyway, it does have this callback function called reduce learning rate on plateau. So when it stagnates, we reduce the learning rate. So we have a patience of zero epochs, which means whenever the loss value on the validation set has not improved, we will reduce the learning rate. And we will do that by multiplying it with a factor of 0 0.1. And we want the minimum learning rate to be this. So it will actually only do this once. It will reduce the learning rate from 1e minus 3, multiplying it by 0.1 gives a learning rate of 1e minus 4. And I found this to help. So now we can train the recurrent neural network and we do that by calling this function here. And that took about 35 minutes to train on my GTX 1070 GPU. Sometimes you will experience not a number when you run this. And if you run it with the setup that I have made in this notebook, you just have to rerun the notebook again. But if you change the architecture, you might also experience it. Or if you change the batch size or sequence length. So you have to experiment a little with this and you can also try and lower the learning rate and so on if you experience not a number during training. Now, because it has run for five epochs where the performance on the validation set has worsened, we will load the best checkpoint that was saved during training. And then we will see its performance on the test set and we get a loss value like this. And this is not really possible to interpret by a human, but what you could do is if you change the architecture, for example, and you want to see if it performs better, you just make a note of this number here and then compare that between the different architectures for the neural network. What we will do here is that we will generate some predictions and plot them. And we have this helper function for doing that. So we take some of the input signals from either the training set or the test set, and then we input that to the neural network. Then we scale the output back to the original scale of the data set, because remember that the neural network will output values between zero and one. And we want to scale that back. So it's proper temperature and pressure values and wind speed and so on. And then we will plot each of the output signals. So the true output signal and the predicted output signal is plotted in a separate figure. Okay, so let's see an example of these plots. First, we use data from the training set. So this is data that the model has seen during training. So we can expect it to probably perform better on this data than it will on the test set. And we plot 1000 time steps. And here we have the plot for the temperature. And the first gray box here is for the warm up period. So we don't expect the model to perform very well here because we have ignored this part in the loss function. And the orange line is for the predicted output and the blue line is for the true output. We don't show all of the input signals in this plot because we have 20 of them. So this would completely mess up our plot. And I'd like to repeat that what we show on the x-axis is the number of time steps of data that we have seen so far. So when it is down here, it hasn't seen very much of the input signals. It has only seen one, two, three, four, five, up to 50 time steps. When we reach 200, it has seen 200 time steps of input signals and so on. Our target data is always shifted 24 time steps into the future. So when we get to 200 here, we have seen input signals for 200 time steps. So the model has a hopefully a better idea of what is going to happen in the future. And then we output one time step, which says the model thinks that the temperature for the target city 24 time steps into the future is going to be this value up here. And it turned out to be roughly correct. And what you will see overall is that the model has learned the daily oscillations of the temperature, but it will quite frequently get the peaks wrong. So for example, here it has predicted the temperature to be here 24 time steps into the future, but the actual temperature 24 time steps into the future was quite a bit higher. And over here, for example, the model has predicted that the future temperature is going to be here. But in reality, the temperature was all the way down here. So the model is OK at predicting these temperature swings in general or sort of on average. But when there is an unexpected peak, it's not very good at predicting that. And remember that this is from the training set. So we can expect it to perform even worse on the test set. And let's go down and look at the wind speed. So here you see that the warm up period has even wider swings. So it's probably a good thing that we have ignored this warm up period when we calculated the loss because we might distort the model. And what you see here is that it has also sort of captured the daily oscillations of the wind speed. Maybe the wind is higher during the day typically and lower during the night or maybe vice versa. I don't know. But it doesn't look like it is very good at predicting the wind speed, even for the training set. 
I suspect that it has just learned these oscillations because it gets the wind speed more correct on average, but it doesn't really understand and predict very well. For example, over here, it can't predict these peak values up here very well. It has just predicted these typical oscillations. So I don't think it's capable of predicting the wind speed very accurately given these input signals. Maybe if you have a more advanced architecture for the neural network, or if you have more weather data, maybe you could do this, but maybe not. Maybe the wind speed is just highly unpredictable. One thing you could try is to predict the minimum and maximum range for the wind speed instead of predicting the actual value. Maybe that would work better and you could try and do that as an exercise. So here we have the prediction for the atmospheric pressure. And once again, you see that the warm up period has some wild swings in the prediction, but otherwise the predicted output signal sort of follows the true output signal, but it appears that there is a short lag. And for some reason, the predicted signal has a lot of noise in it. It is not as smooth as the true signal. So now let's look at an example from the test set. And if we plot it down here, we have the temperature. And once again, we see that it has predicted these daily oscillations quite well, but the peaks are not always predicted very well. For example, here, the predicted temperature was 10 degrees, while the actual temperature turned out to only be five degrees and so on. But otherwise it looks like the future temperature has predicted reasonably well. So let's go down and look at the wind speed. And here we see the same problem. Actually, I think it's even worse here that the model has just learned to generate some oscillations that roughly follow the average swings, but it doesn't seem to predict it very well when it changes. For example, here we have wind speeds from eight going down to about two and the prediction doesn't follow that very well. So here we have the atmospheric pressure. And remember that this is for the test set. Once again, we see that the predicted output signal for the warm up period is just all over the place with huge swings. But after the warm up period, it sort of follows the true output signal. But again, we see this lag and we see this high frequency noisy content as well. So what we have seen in this tutorial is how to use a recurrent neural network to predict several time series from a number of input signals. We used weather data for five cities to predict tomorrow's weather for one of those cities. And it worked reasonably well for predicting the temperature where the daily swings were predicted quite well, but the peaks were sometimes not predicted so accurately. And the atmospheric pressure was also predicted reasonably well, although the predicted signal was more noisy and had a short lag. We could not predict the wind speed very well, and that might be because it has a high random element. So it's simply very difficult to predict. You can use this method with different time series, but you should be careful to distinguish between causation and correlation in the data because the neural network may discover patterns in the data that are only temporary correlations. So they will not generalize very well to unseen data. So you should select input and output data with a causal relationship that makes sense. And you should have a lot of data available for the training and you should try and reduce the risk of overfitting the model to the training data, for example, using early stopping like we did in this tutorial. So as usual, you can download all of this by clicking on the link below the video.